if we can do what's right, and both sides will be pissed off. That's right. <laughs> yep. uh, a lot to be said for that. Thank you. You're welcome. And we'll, we'll have to play with it a little bit, but it's all here. We'll just have to play with it after to get it set up. But really, HR was a good friend. As long as they're okay with my dogs, then I'll be Big crowd. I can't get rid of this. Behind, you, Terry? Just a couple clicks. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. We are glad you are here. Uh, we have, uh, we are blessed to live where we live and to live in this day and time. And uh, we thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to now call on Reg Reverend Roger Rayburn from Mox Church to give us our invocation. Reverend. To the council members, other elected officials, uh, those who are diligently, I just had vocal <laughs> so, um, so I'm really trying here. Um, and to all the guests that are gathered here, I bring greetings from Mox Church. Um, for the prayer this evening, I, I really would like to, to read from Proverbs. And uh, it says this, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for its silver and search for its hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From the mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield for those who walk, whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of the faithful ones. And I pray for wisdom for all of you. And lastly, a brief piece from the prayer that was taken from the first prayer ever given at Congress. This was back in December 19, uh, 1777 by the Reverend Duche. So pray with me. Be thou present, O God of wisdom, and direct the counsels of this honorable assembly. Enable them to settle things on the best and surest foundation that the scene of blood may be speedily closed, that order, harmony, and peace may be effective and restored, and truth and justice, religion and piety prevail and flourish among all thy people. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> uh, for our pledge tonight, we, um, the Reverend Michael D. Byrd, who served in the U.S. Air Force from 1972 to 1978. His expertise with the rifle afforded him the opportunity to serve in a special mobility unit called Prime Beef. Uh, Reverend Bird served several temporary duty assignments while per permanently stationed at K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base in Upper Michigan, where he was NCOIC of the Base Electric Shop, base intrusion alarms and duress systems, base honors team, strategic air command pride airman, and distinguished graduate at Barksdale Air Force Base NCO Academy. After being discharged, Reverend Bird worked in the textile industry in Italy. It was there that God called Reverend Bird into full-time ministry. He has served several churches of all denominations while of several denominations while an adjunct faculty member at Duke Divinity School. Reverend Bird continues to serve as a consultant for church conflict and management, res management and resolution and is employed by a local retail manufacturer here in Moxville. Reverend Bird is grateful to be alive after being diagnosed with cancer in March 2019 that was caused by chemical exposure while serving in the military given two months to live after being diagnosed with stage four prostate 
and bladder cancer, his response to the medical staff at UNC Cancer Hospital was, Doc, you're not in charge. If asked today how he's doing, he would say, I'm vertical. His favorite message is, look up, not around, then everything will be okay. Reverend Byrd, thank you for leading us in the pledge tonight. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. for your service. <laughs> Our ethics and conflicts dis disclosure, Mr. Vogler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 160A-86 and David County Code of Ethics adopted December of 2019, I'd ask each of you before you adopt the agenda if there's any actual potential or perceived conflicts of interest with respect to any matter on the agenda which you come for a vote tonight. If so, please speak up for the agenda is adopted. Mr. Chair, seeing no one speak up, I conclude there's no actual potential or perceived conflicts of interest by any board member. Thank you. Uh, motion to adopt the agenda. I make a motion we adopt the agenda. Ms. Finney, do we have a second? Mr. Reniger, uh, any discussion? All in favor? Uh, now we have a special presentation to make. Uh, it is, uh, we are blessed as Davie County Commissioners to uh, have Karen Logan as our clerk. And this is a special time of recognition for clerks all across uh, North Carolina at least, maybe across the country, and we would like to uh, present a proclamation for, uh, for uh, Clerk's Week here in Davie County, proclaiming it May 5th through the 11th, 2024. And I'm gonna read this proclamation, and then we will all come down and, and present it to our wonderful clerk. Whereas it is imperative to the democratic process that a well-informed citizenry participates in the operation of their local government, and whereas the, the office of the clerk to the board provides communication link between citizens, the local governing body, and administrative departments and local government partners, and whereas the position of clerk is one of the oldest in local government, dating at least to biblical times, and whose term has long been associated with the written word, so it is, it is that modern day clerks are official record keepers for their counties. And whereas North Carolina law requires every board of county commissioners to appoint a clerk and the clerk continues in that position at the pleasure of the board. And whereas the clerk's most significant statutory uh, concerns, the preparation, filming, safeguarding of local government records but the statutory duties constitute only a portion of what the clerk actually does. Whereas the clerk plays a vital role in county government and provides the written record needed to ensure that the board is accountable to its citizens and to other public and private officials. And whereas the clerk is sometimes described as the hub of the wheel, and I will mm -hmm. certainly concur with that, and I think they, all of our commissioners will say something here in a minute, in local government because of the central work that the clerk plays in government's communication. Whereas as local government becomes larger and more complicated, the clerk's role as a professional, dispassionate provider of information to citizens, government officials, and the media becomes more and more important. Whereas clerks have the opportunity to participate in the North Carolina Association of County Clerks, a very active professional association of public officials dedicated to improving the professional competency of clerks. And whereas in cooperation with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Government and International Institute of Municipal Clerks, the North Carolina Association of Clerks helps to sponsor a nationally recognized examination certification program that culminates in the receipt of designation of certified municipal clerk. Whereas in addition, the North Carolina Association of County Clerks and the School of Government sponsor 
state certification programs leading to the designation of certified county clerk as well as opportunities for experienced clerks to maintain the continuing professional education needed to remain state certified and to earn advanced master clerk's designation. Whereas in addition to conducting education programs, the North Carolina Association of County Clerks also directly assists the clerks in job mentoring programs to provide guidance to assist clerks in their day-to-day -day work. Whereas clerks upon their own initiative participate in these certification and education programs, including annual meetings of the North Carolina uh, Association of County Clerks and the International Institute of Municipal Clerks, which not only improve the operation of their office, but through their achievements and awards bring favorable publicity to the counties in which they serve. And whereas clerks are involved at the state level, as well as in potential legislative and other matters of interest, whereas although clerks work for the Board of Commissioners, they truly provide public service. Now therefore, the Davie County Board of Commissioners does hereby recognize the week of May 5 through 11 as clerks to the Board of County Commissioners Week and extends our appreciation to our clerk, uh, to our board, Karen Logan, and to all county clerks for the vital services they perform in their exemplary dedication to the county they represent. Adopted this day, this sixth day of May, 2024. Uh, and um, Brent, uh, uh, commissioners, if you'd like to say, say a word as we do this for Karen. Karen, just like to thank you for your diligent work and how much help you've been, especially recently. You've been a lot of help to me because we've been doing a major remodeling. So, keeping me th straight, keeping things straight, that's been a blessing. Thank you. So, Karen goes above and beyond her job daily. Um, after hours, on the weekends, it doesn't matter if she knows there's a message that needs to be sent out or something that needs to be added to our calendar, she is quick to do so. Not only that, but she regularly represents us when we can't be somewhere that we maybe should be, and she represents us well. So thank you so much for everything that you do, Karen. Yep. I appreciate her diligence. She really does a great job, and um, but she keeps us on task. We have lots of places to be, and sometimes things can get uh, overbooked, double booked, mm -hmm. and um, she does a great job of keeping us on task, and mm -hmm. thank you for that. Davie County has always been fortunate to have really good employees, and we've had good, good clerks to the board, too. Karen is no exception to that. She is excellent, and we appreciate all that you do and, and keeping us in line. Thank you. I know somebody else that probably appreciates her too, and that's Brian, because now instead of us calling him three and four times a day, we're calling Karen three and four times a day. So uh, uh, appreciate y'all's teamwork too. We're gonna step down and present you with this, Karen. And I'll jump in here real quick. What, what many of you may not know is um, tonight we've implemented a new system uh, and with Karen's help and our technology solutions department, um, our live stream and our agenda are up and running tonight for the first time. So I wanted to give them kudos for the hard work to make this available and transparent to the public. Public comment period. Mr. Chair, we've had several people sign up tonight. Uh, before we start with each one of them, I'll go over some of the rules. Each party or each speaker is allowed a total of three minutes to speak and shall immediately stop when his or her three minutes are up. Uh, Karen has a time uh, device that's on the computer up there so you'll know when, when it comes time for you to stop. Uh, 
She has been appointed as timekeeper. Uh, you shall address the board as a whole, shall not ask for any verbal exchanges back from the board. It's not the intent of the public comment to require the board to answer any impromptu questions. There shall be no discussion between the speakers and members of the audience. All comments shall be in verbal form. The speaker shall not be allowed to record, uh, play any recordings or devices during such comment time period. All speakers expect to observe decorum in the meeting, to be respectful in their language, in presentation or refrain from use of any profanity or shouting or making any disclosures that are prohibited by the Personnel Act with respect to any county employee. Uh, all comments are limited to subjects which are in the jurisdiction of the Davie County Board of County Commissioners. The speaker is to make all presentations from the podium provided, shall not be allowed to physically approach the board or staff members without the express invitation by the chair or other designated presiding officers of the board. Uh, when you, your name is called, if you could come forward to the podium, state your name so that Karen can get that on, on the record, and then she will start the timer at that time. First we have is Joe Everett Sr. to speak on the advanced rezoning. And real quick, Mr. Chairman, um, from our last meeting, we found out if you could make sure to speak into the microphone so those at home watching can hear it uh, as clear. I'm Joe Everett Sr. Uh, I'm here to speak about the rezoning issue in advance. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Rye has uh, stated in the past uh, what a good neighbor he would be and how well he would keep his property. We have a picture here that my son has on the front row showing uh, his location where he op operates his business today. This was today. Dumpsters full, units all lying on the ground. Mr. Uh, Rye has applied to change the zoning of the property bordering our property and other properties to highway business provisional. His proposed building site is in the far corner of the property, away from the highway entrance, next to three adequate, uh, next to three residential properties, and can, due to elevations, cannot be adequately screened, uh, including dumpsters, which are constantly overflowing at his current site. This would benefit the current owner and Mr. Rye, increasing the value of that property while hurting the value of my property and the other surrounding properties. This is unfair to our neighborhood. I received a text today from a family that's looking to uh, try to buy a property that also borders this, and they say, we, we met you while uh, looking at the big White House. Do you mind letting us know what happens to the vote tonight? I'm praying that they vote against it. The vote will absolutely affect how we choose to proceed. I love that house and would love to bring it back to life. This would affect that property and our properties. There are other options available to Mr. Rye, including a property he already owns as his own business and a tract of more than 50 acres where he lives. Does he not want a business located adjacent to his house? Can he not keep it clean enough for his family? Our concerns also include environmental impact. If you've ever seen a dumpster being loaded, they leak any liquids concerning, uh, including rainwater and oils that can escape from damaged HVAC units. The pollution will end up in the groundwater or flow onto our property where the stream, uh, stream where the property drains. We would not hesitate to report such problems to appropriate agencies and take legal action if necessary. All adjoining property owners, along with the owners, others, who live nearby are opposed to this zoning change. The current owner has rejected our, an offer by our family to purchase the property for several thousand dollars above the current tax value, and he has made no counter offer, will not negotiate. Please do not approve this zoning change. Thank you. Mr. Chair, the next individual is Harold Wood on pickleball facilities. Thanks for your time. Uh, I know y'all got a lot of serious matters to deal with, and this is a fun matter, and, uh, but it's very important to a lot of us in, in the county. Um, and what I want to talk about is pickleball facilities. And I've retired a couple years ago, and it's kind of like, you know, what do you do, this, that, and other, and uh, I wanted to be active. And I've never played pickleball before. 
and I started at the, uh, the Brock Gym through the Senior Center, and they have a very active group that plays there on Monday uh, morning, Wednesday evening, and Friday morning, and that's basically the set times. We also have an opportunity in the county to play at the rec department, and um, we have five courts there. We have two at the Brock Gym. These are indoor facilities we're playing on the gym floor, which, which is very nice. And uh, at the rec department, we can play on Tuesday and Thursday mornings, from like 9 to 11. Well, the need is we need an outdoor facility. Um, once I started playing, it's very addictive. I don't know if any of y'all played, but it's, that's kind of one thing about pickleball. It's, it's addictive. You get hooked. You want to play more and more, and outdoor is like a more realistic type of play, I guess, because uh, all the pros play outdoor. Even a lot of the indoor facilities now, they're playing on outdoor courts. And I go to uh, Johnny Moser in uh, Louisville. I go to Salisbury at uh, City Park. I go to Statesville to Caldwell Park. And I've been to several different parks in Winston. Uh, yesterday I played in a league at Sedge Garden in Winston that had 10 brand new courts. And it, it was a lot of fun. And when I go to like Johnny Moser where they have nine courts, I see all kind of people from Davie County there. And when I tell people we don't have outdoor facility, they don't, they don't get it. And I'm like, well, we're working on it because I know at the rec department we've got plans that we've talked about. And I'm just basically here tonight to say, can, can we keep looking at this? Can we move forward and, and know that there's a big pool of people out there, young people and seniors and all in between that are, are, are looking for places to play. And uh, so thank you very much, and that's all I have. So. Next individual to sign up is Tom Browder on the Bailey Rye Rezoning. Thanks for giving me time to speak on this. Karen, I'd like to offer you a job. <laughs> um, I am here in support of the rezoning request in advance, and I felt like I needed to come and speak because the Rye family uh, is new to Davie County. They've been here about a year and a half. I know them because they bought my house and uh, displaced me over to Forsyth County. But um, I have gotten to be good friends with them and I can tell you just as a reference, there is no better family that we would want to welcome into our community. And I can assure you that if Brad says he's gonna not be dirty or nasty or spill stuff on the ground, that he's not going to. Um, I know there's been some talk about certain kinds of screenings and that kind of thing, and I, I feel like, based on what I've talked to him about, that he's willing to do most anything. I also happen to have the pleasure of knowing the person that is selling this land, and I have known him my whole life, and you couldn't ask for a nicer person. Uh, that doesn't mean you should pass something, because you can have a nice person that's wanting something in an inappropriate place. Based on what I know, the county's overlay, um, whatever the plan is that you all do out in advance, has called for this area to be zoned exactly what he's asking it to be. I can tell you, I'm not sure what White House Mr. Everett was talking about. I can tell you a house that I loved in advance. Ethel Smith Deal's house was one of the most beautiful houses along that stretch literally, I think, adjacent to where Brad is talking about putting his. They tore it down, and there's now some kind of, it looks like a bunch of garage doors that houses a company that puts, does something with elevators, which I don't know that there's much of a demand for in Davie County. But I can tell you, with all the people that are moving into Davie County, one thing that we do need is somebody to work on our HVAC systems. Most of these companies out here, and, and many of y'all may not know this, private equity is buying up all kinds of companies like this, and it's not just in the HVAC business, it's in my own industry. Um, so having somebody 
in the county. Kids are in the county. His oldest son is in business with him. Uh, just could not be a better mix for those of us that might just have our air conditioner go out on a Friday afternoon and need somebody to come work on it on Saturday morning. I've seen Brad go out and do stuff like this, and he's done right much work for me, all of which has been fairly priced and uh, done with good workmanship. So I guess that's my time. Thank you. Next sign up is Ashley Everett on the Rye Bailey rezoning. Thank you for your time tonight. At the end of the previous three meetings, Mr. Rye has stated that he just wants everyone to be happy. Even though he has heard us state in very clear terms that none of the neighbors surrounding this pro property will be happy if rezoning is approved. And our discontent, oh, I'm so sorry. I can start over. <laughs> Okay, shall I start over? I will. I'll say it again. At the end of the previous three meetings, Mr. Rye has stated that he just wants everyone to be happy, even though he's heard us express in very clear terms that none of the neighbors surrounding this property will be happy if rezoning is approved. And our discontent isn't caused by a temporary inconvenience that may happen due to construction of an HVAC warehouse. No, we have stated in unequivocal detail that we will be unhappy because of the very real environmental and financial damage caused to our residential properties if this HVAC warehouse is built in our rural residential neighborhood, not on the highway as the rezoning request states. This is the fourth meeting about this one acre of usable residential property. This has been four months of a trying to appease a man who already operates a business in the county. He already owns property that is currently and rightfully zoned for commercial use. This is four months of holding off the residents surrounding this small wooded acre to try to get conditions just right. In the last month alone, the Davy Enterprise has had three issues pertaining to county sentiments regarding rezoning and construction issues that are potentially harmful to our county. The April 11th edition had an actual article on this very rezoning issue. And if you read the article, it should be clear that public sentiment does not favor this type of rezoning. Please listen to your constituents. And I don't mean just the ones who can afford to buy million dollar properties, shield their houses from anything around them. Listen to us who don't have all that wealth, but. Are, have the blessing of living on our family's land for 100 years now. Please listen to all of us. Citizens of Davie County want rural areas to remain rural. Mr. Rye already owns the properly zoned land to build a new warehouse. His business does not belong in the woods behind our houses. Please vote no against rezoning. Thank you. Next, Mr. Chair, we got Jody Everett again on the Rye Bailey rezoning. I'd intended just to read my email to the commissioners into the public comments tonight, but I do want to remind the, the commissioners and the live stream audience, the YouTube watchers that may be watching this, that Mr. Browder stood at this very podium in August of 2022 speaking against a proposed rezoning by Jake Miller on the, on the same identical property that was also part of the Davies Comprehensive Plan. Just wanted to get that out there on the record. Here's my email. Commissioners, at this point, after four plus months of positioning, of pointing out issues on various iterations of the proposed Rye Bailey rezoning, I really don't have a lot left to say. Now is your chance to send a message that Davie County is not the rezoning and uncontrolled development nightmare that many in the county already believe it to be. As I'm sure you've seen from the recent articles and addition, editorials in the Davie Enterprise, as well as local social media posts, too numerous to count, the residen residential taxpayers of the county are fed up with the rapid expansion of business and multifamily developments throughout the county. The current Rye Bailey proposal flirts with the issue of, a spot, of spot zoning. 
I previously offered Mr. Bailey $50,000 for the parcel, which is 18% above tax value, and he hasn't, and he said I wasn't even in the ballpark and refused to counteroffer when I requested. Mr. Bailey is certainly free to ask whatever he wants for the property, but the reality is the only way that the parcel is playing in a different ballpark is if this board rezones to commercial to the benefit of one landowner at the detriment of surrounding owner's property values. Despite numerous proposals, Mr. Rye has yet to provide any concrete details that would address neighbors' concerns around screening, traffic, water runoff, or financial damage. Mr. Rye has clearly demonstrated an urge to build, but has not demonstrated a definitive plan. While I appreciate the board's potentially attempting to place restrictions on the re rezoning, there is no way any restrictions could possibly foresee the future well enough to protect the residential neighbors. Had the site been along the highway where other businesses are located, the business that Mr. Barada referred to, the owner's here, it's a residential stairlift company, well enough to protect the residential neighbors, um, excuse me, had the, had the site been along the highway where other businesses are located, conditions may have may have been more appropriate. However, the proposed the, the proposal, 150 yards deep in the woods with the build site itself surrounded entirely by residential neighbors is inappropriate under any conditions. I encourage you all to take this opportunity to vote no to the proposed rezoning, thereby protecting the rural character of Davie County and sending a message to all residents of the county that our, vote, that our voices are heard. Thank you. Next, we have Sandra Mahonian. Mahonian. Mahonian, excuse me, on the Rye Bailey matter. People get that name wrong all the time. <laughs> <laughs> As a majority property owner to be affected by most of this rezoning, I must ask is if this is a decision worth making to benefit only two individuals and be the detriment of the surrounding residents and property owners. This decision should never have passed the zoning board. It should never have been put in your hands. Just because most of the area of my family's property is undeveloped, does it make it open to be destroyed by a neighbor or you with water runoff of such a sizable nature and financial damage. As stated in my prior email to you, it is clear that the sellers have finally found a buyer who is willing and has the funds to build within the constraints of the seller's property. The awkwardness and positioning of the driveway, building, and septic show there is a story as to why the positioning is what it is. Someone, anyone, find out what the story is. Then and only then will you see that this benefits only two people, buyer and seller. A small map showing the location of the driveway and building location is all that I have seen in what the proposed site will look, at, look like. I know where the septic area is to be located because I saw the perk test done in the corner of our property with the addresses of 139 Feed Mill Road and 145 Feed Mill Road. We, the James family, respectfully request that you deny this unnecessary rezoning and protect our undeveloped property from an unnatural and early death due to the conditions that this construction will place on our land. Voting yes for the benefit of two people is just not a good enough reason to vote yes. There is no real value to the neighborhood of Advance for this rezoning. It does not fit into the rural characteristics of Advance, and it never will. It stands to reason, given the other sites this owner operates on, that the intention is to hide from the view the eyesores currently located at his current locations. I respectfully ask that you vote no to this proposed rezoning and protect not only we, the surrounding residents, but also Advance as well. Rezoning commercial when the, land, when the build site is surrounded by residential neighbors is just not appropriate to what the citizens of Davie County want for the county. There are plenty of locations within Davie County appropriate for this business, just not in our backyards. Thank you. And then the last one to sign up is Chip Miller, and it does not have what it's about. Yeah. 
It's about pickleball. I just have one little thing to add. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to say that. Be, you know, this, anyway, one more thing that Mr. Mickle didn't uh, tell you about is on the weekends, we actually have nine courts in the county, which is amazing. You guys have done the greatest job on that rec center. I am so proud of that. I have a lot of friends that come to see me from Charlotte, and I show them around. They can't believe it. They just can't believe what a great place that is. Uh, like I said, we're counting the wine, Alice. Old guys get silver sneakers. So we really have nine. You say, well, that should be enough. But the thing is, the one thing that he didn't say was the Y closes at 1 o'clock on Saturday. And we do not have an opportunity to play anywhere else because the rec is the, the uh, Brock is closed for, for the uh, Saturday and Sunday. And the rec, all the boys and kids play basketball all day long. And that's why we're asking for the outdoor courts because then we'd have a place to play. I don't know if you've ever seen in Salisbury, they have a really nice place where they uh, put in a card and that gives them access into the pickleball area. It wouldn't have to be manned. Also, one more thing, I, you know, us old people are speaking for ourselves and we can, we're off all the time. We have a lot of people and kids, teenagers, a little older people, that still work. And they do not have a place to play if they get off of work. Um, the rec is closed at five and the Brock is closed usually at six o'clock because they either have volleyball or they have basketball. So that's why we're, we hate to, you know, ask for the moon here, but we definitely want you to know we're interested in doing that. So thank you for your time and I'm sorry, thank you. Chip, Harold is not that old. <laughs> now he he and I graduated school together, so he cannot be that old. <laughs> and he, he, but I will tell you this: I think Harold plays uh, pickleball or has played with my son-in-law Michael, and so I know how addictive it is. Uh, I would tell you guys, uh, just FYI, uh, the uh, recreation board is in the process of developing their their CIP, their capital improvement pan, plan. Uh, priorities and I Paul when do y'all meet again uh, next, Monday. next Monday so that may be a good opportunity to go down and be in the middle of that uh, and let them know how you feel about the priority of that and uh, as they bring bring it back to us thank you thanks guys um, now we have a public hearing uh, Mr. East. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, board, tonight I present to you an application, Mr. George Holtz has applied to rename Sweat Trail, located in Moxville, to Sweet Trail, located in Moxville, North Carolina. If you want to look at where the property is located at, it's the northern part of Farmington Road, almost to the very end into Yadkin County. I think there's a couple of more roads up Farmington Road before you get there. Uh, Mr. Holtz uh, applied. The application went through the Technical Review Committee, all individual uh, Party signed off on it, EMS, GIS, and us, and agreed to, um, to take it forward to, to this board for approval. I did receive a couple of phone calls about it. They were concerned when we put the sign up about the public hearing, and I said, it's just a road naming. It's nothing else. It's not a rezoning. So that's where we're standing with that, and everybody that I spoke to is in, uh, in favor of approving. So I'd be more than happy to address any questions that this board has at the present time. So we already have a Sweet Creek Trail. Mm -hmm. So this will be Sweet Trail. Correct. And then what is the name of, in there's a road similar to that near Hope Baptist Tabernacle on 158? 
I, I'm not sure. It did go through EMS approval to approve the name of it. Isn't there so. one, Joseph, close to there that's similar to that? Sweetwood. So that'll give us a sweet wood, a sweet creek, and a sweet. Sweet County. Evidently. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Public hearing. Chair has announced this is the day and hour of the public hearing pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 153A-239.1 of the General Statutes of North Carolina, and also pursuant to Chapter 94 of the Davie County Code of Ordinance regarding the renaming of Sweat Trail, Moxville, North Carolina, to Sweet Trail, Moxville, North Carolina. There's been due notice given pursuant to the requirements of North Carolina General Statutes and Davie County Code of Ordinance by way of due publication of a notice, the public hearing in the newspaper general circulation in Davie County. There's an affidavit that's been attached to your minutes uh, or to this agenda. I would ask all who wish to comment at this public hearing to come forward to the podium, state your full name for the board, and then comment on the proposal. Mr. Chair, seeing no one come forward, I've now turned the public hearing back over to you as board chair uh, for a motion to close the public comment section of this public hearing, provide the board with the opportunity to discuss among yourselves what, if any, action you wish to take with regards to this matter. This matter. Thank you, sir. Motion to close. Mr. Poindexter, do I have a second? Second. Ms. Finney, all in favor? Okay. Um, do we have a motion? Or Tony, any is other he discussion? the only resident on that road? Is he no, the only resident? No, there's three. Um, we did receive the application, and all three residents agreed to it and signed off on it. We make sure that everybody's involved with it, that everybody's aware of it. But, yeah, everyone, they said down the road, he, he mentioned that it would be easier to sell something on Sweet Trail than Sweat Trail. So... Well, my concern about it is because we currently have an address issue because of road naming. So that is why I brought up the fact that we have these similarly named roads because the next thing will be they're not getting their mail because their mail's going to somewhere else. So that, that'll be on them if they request it. So. And, and, and we'll say this, when we do these processes, it goes out. Uh, EMS, Emergency Services, GIS reviews it to make sure that it's not too similar, and they felt like it wasn't similar enough to where they could identify where it was location wise, and they get the approval. It wouldn't come to this board until ever all the parties uh, on the back end were okay with it. Okay, so the street numbers are what 180, yeah, 172, there's, there's two, 172, and 180. That's so, it. is there a 180 and a 172 on Sweet Creek and um, the other sweet, whatever I said? Do they have the same house numbers on we those would. on those streets yeah. as well? Because that's why we got the issue on the other street. Because the numbers are the same, so UPS and Amazon, they, they're they not as accurate as EMS. Right, correct, so, correct. I would be curious to know that, if the numbers are the same, to cause confusion. <clears throat> I can be more than happy to, to check into that. I mean, that might, it might just be me, but I'm just saying. Motion. If no one else has a problem with it, then that's fine. But I'm just, that's that's where we're in discussion with another problem. And if those street numbers are the same with those similarly named trails, they're all trails, not a road, not a lane. They're all trails and they all have sweet in them. So I just see issues coming. So. Would you like to defer? If I'm the only one with a problem, that's fine. But I'm just want more, my opinion known. So if nobody else has a concern with that, you you all move as you see fit. But okay, well, I guess I'm questioning how big an issue is it. I mean, if it's a big issue, then well, it is a big it. issue for a current resident that um, currently who's this who lives on a similarly named road and they have the same number. So the neighbor is getting the mail and the neighbor's not returning the mail. So that's a big issue. So I. If these numbers are the same, yeah. then I think it has potential to be an issue. I know specifically the one you're speaking Yeah, about. you do. So that, that is a huge issue, and yeah. going forward, that would be addressed. Those are two. But if these three trails have the same numbers, then we're opening this up to have that same issue. Okay. That's my concern. So that's. Any other questions? Now, if 
if it's an issue, we can defer it. I don't think 30 days is going to tear the process up. Yeah. Uh, but that's entirely up to you all. We'd have to have a motion. I don't see that 30 days is going to change the world as far as renaming this road. So if that's an issue, I think we should address it. Sure, sure. I've had uh, conversations with Mr. Holtz about this and mm -hmm. told him this is a long process and just work with us to make sure that we do our due diligence with that. And he, he was okay. I don't, I don't know that he has any time constraints associated with this. So, you know, I can, I can double check and report back to the board next month. Well, on Sweetwood Trail that she asked, uh, Joseph about I know there's only a couple of houses on that street so it's 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 a similar look mm -hmm. now what the numbers are I have no idea do um, you all want to make a motion if the numbers are different then it may yeah. be fine okay. but if the numbers are the same it may not be fine I make a motion to defer you have a second second as Finney seconds any other discussion all in favor all right very good um, Five-year master aging plan. We once you get done doing that, you're, yeah, you call us up. And I think Terry has a presentation. Okay. Yep. Um, <clears throat> congratulations are in order this evening. I want to congratulate Davie County for becoming the 19th community in North Carolina and the 881th community in the United States to enroll in the ARP uh, network of age-friendly states and communities. Um, because of work that's already been done by the Master Aging Plan, the Davie County has been accepted and recognized as a member of this network. As a member, Davie County is showing their commitment to working we're becoming more age friendly under the criteria established by ARP. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the nation's local leaders who have committed to Davie County becoming more livable and age friendly. We're working to improve the community for people of all ages and life stages. The forward thinking demonstrated by this commitment will make Davie County an even better place to be. In addition, ARP and local leaders recognize that well designed, age friendly communities foster economic growth and make for happier, healthier residents of all ages. I want to thank Kim Shusky and her team for all their leadership efforts on the Master Aging Plan and working through this plan to enroll and ensure Davie County is recognized as a <laughs> network of age-friendly states and communities. So we have a presentation. We would ask the okay. board to come up and present this, but um, while they're coming forward, we'll get set up. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> All right. Kim, do you want to get all your staff that's here? Oh, yeah. Terry. All right, well, thank you. Building on the um, uh, acceptance into the network of AARP's um, age-friendly communities, we are pleased to be here tonight to present the Davie County Master Aging Plan for the next five years, 2024 to 2029. And this plan represents a 10-month effort um, of a lot of different people. Um, it's designed to build upon the work of the previous five-year master aging plan, but also to provide the framework for aging in Davie County for the next five years. And although senior services did lead the process of doing this master aging plan, it was certainly a collaborative effort of many individual citizens, representatives from business and nonprofit communities, and service providers from both the public and private sectors. 
In fact, there were over or about 70 people who were involved in this plan in some way. We do have several here tonight. If you would allow me, I would love for them to stand to be recognized if you were involved in the plan. Thank you all so much. So following AARP's framework for age-friendly communities, the group decided to focus on four areas and uh, to set goals for groups and organizations in our county to strive toward um, in order to make Davie, Plant, Davie County a better place to age. The plan contains 36, I'm sorry, 39 specific strategies that we think will make an impact on aging in Davie County. And those are detailed in the plan. Tonight, of course, we're just gonna provide you with a high level overview of that plan. Obviously, our older adult population is growing significantly, so Michelle will discuss some demographics. First, we wanna thank Allison Brown for putting our demographic information together for our plan. Allison's with us here tonight. Thanks, Allison. Um, Davie County's population is expected to grow by 22% from 2022 to 2042. As you can see on the chart there, of course, that's no surprise that the fastest growing segment of that population is the 60 plus category. Already, the number of people in Davie County under age 18 is less than the number of people age 60 and older. As you can see, 8,095 in the under 18 versus 12,822 in the 60 plus. And by 2042, Davie's percentage of people age 60 and older will represent the largest segment of the total population at 33%, growing with a rate of 36% over the next 20 years. Within the age uh, 60 plus group, uh, and those age 65 plus will grow by 45%, as you'll see in the chart. And then those age 85 plus will more than double at 118% growth. As you can see, more than a fourth of Davies age 65 plus population live alone. And also nearly a fifth of the 60 plus population live between 100 and 200% of poverty, meaning a household of one makes less than $2,510 per month. So of course this raises heightened concerns about their well-being over the years, which makes planning for the future crucial. All right, so how did we create this plan? Um, once again, as I mentioned, Senior Services did take the lead on the process, um, and we conducted a, a needs assessment process during October of 2023 that consisted of personal interviews with 18 different key stakeholders. Uh, we conducted surveys. Those were available via paper and online as well. And we had four focus groups called Community Conversations, where we did some one-on-one -on -one, um, talking with the attendees there to get their input about what concerns them with aging. Once we um, gathered all the information, a steering committee was um, met together. That steering committee was primarily made up of representatives from Senior Services Advisory Council, as well as the Davie County Aging Services Planning Committee. And so they met to streamline, uh, prioritize, and um, create the areas of focus. The issues that you see on the screen were sort of the ones that kept rising to the top as the most frequently heard concerns. Again, we used AARP's framework for age-friendly communities as we um, decided on the focus areas. You can see that their framework contains eight domains of livability. And based on the information that we received from the needs assessment process, the group decided to focus on four of those. So those were outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, housing, health services, and community support. Then the uh, steering committee secured community volunteers in order to serve in the work groups for each of these areas of focus. Work group members met over a three month period to develop goals, objectives, strategies, and indicators for each area. And for accountability purposes, members also identified who the responsible parties would be for each objective. Once the work group meetings were complete, all the information was compiled into one master plan. 
And so this is an excerpt from the plan so you can see sort of the structure of the plan. You'll see the goal. This particular one had, uh, I believe, two objectives, the strategies under each, the indicators for each strategy, and then the responsible parties for that objective. So this is what the plan looks like as a whole. So our first domain that we focused on was outdoor spaces and buildings. So people need public spaces to gather both indoors and out. These spaces, along with recreational programming, provide citizens the opportunity to improve their health and their quality of life. There was a lot of discussion in our needs assessment process about a desire for more recreational opportunities, particularly outdoor opportunities. An age-friendly community needs spaces that are safe and well-maintained with conveniences such as seating and public restrooms, along with diverse and inclusive programming for all ages and abilities. Our goal for this domain is to enhance outdoor spaces and buildings along with recreational programming to be inclusive and accessible for all citizens. So you'll see here some of our objectives. The first objective is to try to get older adults more engaged in the planning process. We do this by helping to increase involvement of older adults on various boards, enhancing leadership skills of older adults through more involvement in civic groups and leadership Davy, and just to get more input from older adults on these matters. Secondly, we wanted to improve our outdoor spaces and buildings by helping various community centers add improvements such as bike paths, outdoor lighting, and restrooms, by adding an outdoor recreation area uh, adjacent to senior services, and by the building of the new agricultural building. And thirdly, uh, finally, we wanted to expand and improve recreational programming by increasing options for pickleball <laughs> and by enhancing collaboration among existing recreation areas. And we promise we didn't put those plants in the audience tonight. <laughs> um, our second domain deals with transportation. Obviously, an effective transportation program is vital so that our citizens are able to access desired services, programming, employment, and engagement opportunities in a safe and efficient manner. So an age-friendly community as it relates to transportation should have options that are accessible, affordable, and safe as well as information about transportation that's easy to understand. So our goal for this domain is to expand transportation options and ensure, ensure that existing options are accessible, well advertised, and easy to use. As far as our objectives, they focus on, uh, firstly, uh, increasing the awareness of the public regarding transportation options and we want to do this by helping to develop a marketing campaign, increasing outreach efforts and educational seminars, and highlighting walkability and public transit through the use of wayfinding way kiosks and signs. Secondly, since we are a small rural community without a large transit system, public transportation is not really the norm. So we want to help our citizens be more aware of how to use public transportation and make them more comfortable in doing so. By seeking out opportunities for shuttle services um, for community events, such as the 4th of July fireworks, which we already have in the works, helping our citizens get used to using tr uh, public transit. We want to help develop a how-to guide on using public transit and offer volunteer opportunities for high school and early college children to serve as a buddy for first-time riders. Our third objective is to develop better advocacy strategies for transportation needs by organizing a ride-along program for elected officials, by developing YVETI's transportation board to better become advocates for transportation needs in the county, and by having an organized presence at various town and county meetings highlighting transportation needs, sidewalks, and greenways. Our fourth objective is to expand public transportation options. And we want to do this by getting all the public transportation um, providers together for a brainstorming and networking session and increasing partnerships with local agencies that might have transportation needs. Our third domain of focus is housing. So an effective housing plan for a county is one in which our citizens are empowered to remain independent and age in the place of their choice with appropriate services and support. 
An age-friendly community should have housing options for various incomes, ages, and stages of life, as well as home modification programs to help citizens remain in their own home. Our goal for housing is to enhance housing options and ensure programs are in place to help citizens remain in their homes if they so choose. So some of the objectives we're focusing on in the housing domain include supporting and expanding our existing housing repair programs such as the Handyman Ministry through Blaze Baptist Church. And we propose to do this by coordinating a community day of service, both to meet the immediate needs and to expand that potential volunteer pool. By developing a network to join the Handyman Repair Program to replicate and expand these types of services to help meet more needs. Secondly, we want to make the community more aware of housing options by developing an, a marketing campaign and by increasing outreach efforts among housing related programs and educational seminars about housing related issues. We want the community to be more engaged about housing related issues. And we will do this by increasing involvement in housing related boards and at public meetings. And fourthly, we want to increase the options for senior housing in our county. Obviously, we as a community member can't build more houses, so the only way we felt, as the committee felt, the community could affect change in this area would be to help collect data supporting the need for additional housing and disseminating that information as widely as possible. All right, our fourth domain is health services and community supports. The health and well-being of the community is strongly connected to accessible and affordable health care, but it's also connected to community support services. So a strong community thinks very broadly about well-being, including supports for the social determinants of health. As such, this is our largest and most broad of the domains. An age-friendly community not only has access to health care, but also to the community support and has a diverse array of supportive services. The age-friendly community promotes healthy living and everyday activities, and they are prepared uh, for times of crisis. So the goal for this domain is to ensure the community has accessible and affordable resources to support the health and well-being of our citizens. We have several objectives in this area, as it is the largest. So the first one, um, we recognize that existing agencies alone are not going to be able to meet all of the needs of our, of our citizens. So we want to create an organized volunteer base to help meet those needs. And we want to try to do that by forming a group or identifying an existing group to coordinate that program. By identifying potential volunteer groups and developing a marketing campaign to recruit not only groups of volunteers but individual volunteers as well. Our second objective focuses on the PACE program, which is the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, and we want to help um, increase awareness and usage of that program. Of all of the counties that this program serves in our region, Davie County has the fewest clients, so we hope to um, increase outreach efforts and educational seminars to help raise awareness of that. We have a vision of an expanded community paramedics program to include a branch solely dedicated to serving older adults. So this is a program that has a model that works. Um, it's very successful and we would like to increase advocacy efforts to help make the needs of that agency more widely known and increase the knowledge about the agency to the community as well. Our fourth objective focuses on um, services. So we already have a lot of services in place in this county. We'd like to increase awareness of these services among social workers who do case management, as well as medical social workers and discharge nurses, so that when people leave the hospital, they're aware of the services that are available to them. And we'll do this by making personal contact with these social workers, as well as distributing written information to them, such as resource guides. And number five, we'd like to help our citizens to be safe in times of weather emergencies. We already have various alert systems in place, such as um, the Sheriff's Department's app, IPAWS, Reverse 911, so we'd like to increase knowledge and promotion of those services that are already there. Number six focuses on improving the mental health of our citizens. We'd like to make people more aware of existing resources for mental health 
and provide more community education on topics related to mental health. Our seventh objective focuses on having more people take advantage of health education programs and preventative care programs. We would like to increase the promotion of these programs and increase education about topics that have programs in place. And number eight, whereas the earlier objective focused on increasing awareness of social workers, we also want to increase awareness of the general citizens in our county about services that are already in place. And we'd like to do this by the creation of an app that our citizens can download as a one-stop shop for this information. All right, so that's our four domains. What is next? Well, this is obviously a very um, le high level overview of the objectives and strategies included in the plan. In fact, there are 123 detailed indicators or outputs that we would like to realize over the next five years. So as far as next steps, it's our hope that you all will formally adopt this plan tonight. And in doing so, you'll agree with all of those who helped us in these uh, workshops and groups that this is the direction that Davie County wants to go as a whole and this is the direction we should be headed in order to make positive impacts on aging. By adopting this plan along with the commitment you've already made regarding membership in the AARP network of age-friendly states and communities, we're asking that you keep the goals, objectives, and strategies detailed in this plan in mind as you make decisions that impact our county, including funding decisions. And then that's really just the beginning. This is a living document and there'll be ongoing meetings for every work group to actually start the work of the plan. Um, in fact, the first one of those is Wednesday and we've got uh, two more in May and the fourth one will be the first week of June. So they're already scheduled, ready to go. We'll invite additional community members to join the work of these groups based on the specific uh, goals and objectives that each is working on. Of course, we'll adjust the strategies whenever necessary in order to minimize the effectiveness and as a member now of AARP's age-friendly states and communities we'll provide regular updates to AARP as part of that plan. What we need everyone to remember is this is not a senior services plan. It is a county-wide group effort that involves many many different people and many many different agencies. So this issues that we have um, put in the plan is what our citizens have said are important to them and the goals, objectives, and strategies is what the groups came together, met months deciding of how to best address those concerns. But the success of the plan is going to depend on continued collaboration and community involvement over the next five years. In fact, the meetings have already been very valuable as far as networking. Uh, we've had some groups that got together that had never met one another before. So there's already been a lot of education about what's already in place in the county. There's been a lot of people who've learned different things that they didn't know before coming. And so the meetings themselves really forced our agencies to kind of stop, take a minute, and think creatively about what aging could be in our county. Um, I think there was a lot of excitement in the work groups. Um, had a hard time actually getting them to wait until Wednesday um, to start working on the plans. They wanted to get started immediately and we already have some things started um, in, in place already. So we certainly want to thank you for your time tonight to hear our plan. Um, you do have the digital copy of the plan in your agenda packets. If you vote on that tonight, we will send that to the printer. We'll have written plans, printed plans available for the community. Um, we'll post it on our website. And we hope that people seeing and reading about the plans, they'll get as excited as some of these work group members and we can really start to make an impact on, on aging in our county. So thank you for your time. Any questions? Questions? I don't have a question, I have a comment. Um, I think the excitement's what it's gonna take to make it happen. So I'm glad that it's already, that you're having a hard time containing it. Mm -hmm. so. Anything else? Thank you for all your work and the demographics you're speaking to are growing in the county. Uh, Absolutely. Very needed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anything else? Okay. Uh, do we, uh, I would do we a, have... I'd make a motion we approve the plan. Ms. Finney makes the motion. Mr. Poindexter seconds. Any other discussion? 
All in favor? That's unanimous. All right. Uh, capital improvement plan. Ms. West, Mr. Blackwelder, or Mr. Lambert, or some variation thereof. Good evening. Tonight we're here to talk to you about the capital improvement plan or the CIP. So last fall, county staff uh, identified capital needs, not only for this plan, but uh, things that we can include in our annual operating budget as well. So this plan would include projects that re require significant investments like buildings, things that the park and infrastructure improvements. So each project included in this plan will exceed $200,000 and usually lasts longer than a year to implement. So we have other needs that we identified when we were going through gathering information about this plan that we are an, uh, analyzing during the annual budget process to see if we're gonna include it in the uh, general fund budget. So just so you know, I'm sure a lot of you know, but as a reminder, we update this plan each year just so we could accommodate the evolving needs of the county, any shifting priorities and funding constraints. So this presentation tonight will be an update as what, of what was presented at the January board retreat for the budget. Uh, so next month, we will include the capital improvement plan in our budget public hearing. You'll also be hearing from Davenport and company. They'll talk to you about the affordability side of it. So tonight, we'll talk about the projects that we plan to include in our draft of the plan. Good evening, board and chair. Uh, thank you all for letting us do this. Uh, just forewarning, this will not be as long as mentioned. Davenport's presentation will be next month. So, uh, uh, as Ms. West said, you know this is a five-year outlook, five-year horizon over the capital improvement plan uh, for the county. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick overview of that five-year horizon and funding availability. Uh, as you see there, we have seven projects listed. Uh, they're in no particular order. Uh, they're basically labeled out as project names and then available years funding you'll see going across from left to right uh, with 2025 through 2029. Uh, each project will be broken down in an individual slide. If you have any questions on any projects, stop me during those slides. I'll be more than willing to help walk you through that or explain that further. Uh, the first one is the uh, new detention center. Uh, it's construction of a new 55,000 square foot facility 147 beds uh, located next to the existing facility on 135 Green Street. Uh, this is the project you've seen the last couple of years. Next, we're looking at parking lot paving. Uh, we've broken that out uh, through 25, 26, and 28. Uh, for next fiscal year, you'll see the hospital lot and the community park front lot is there for funding. These are just pictures indicating those lots. Uh, the two lots there on the left are the front parking lot at the recreation facility and the center top is the hospital lot. Next is the demolition of the old HHS DSS building located on Hospital Street. This has also been in the CIP plan for several years. Uh, this will be the decommissioned demolition of that facility. Next we've got a new enclosed storage space facility. Uh, this will be unconditioned space with finished floor possibly electrical located at or near the old hospital site. Um, this estimated cost really depends on what we look at that facility being, whether that's unconditioned, fully conditioned space, uh, power doors. Uh, next we have splash pad resurfacing. Uh, this would take the current splash pad wet surface area and turn that into a rubberized type non-slip, non-skid type uh, material. Uh, I know through Paul, I know he's mentioned it in some of his presentations, how a new safety surfacing will help prevent any injuries from falls and slips. Uh, this is a high priority. And next we have EMS Station 5 to be located in the northwest portion of Davie County. Uh, this is very similar to the new station, EMS Station 4, uh, minus one bay and minus two living quarters. And lastly is the new Civic Ag Center. Uh, this is just a rendering. Uh, there's no plans or preliminary designs in the works. 
Uh, but here is what that facility could look like on the new track that was purchased off Main Church Road. You have any questions pertaining to the county CIP before I turn it over to Mr. Lambert? The, the, I have just a brief question, and uh, I'll use what we talked about earlier about um, the issue brought up in terms of recreation. Um, I know the rec committee is going through their CIP process now. It, how are we here when maybe we have not heard their recommendations, and I just use them as an example, uh, senior services may have ideas, uh, capital needs. Uh, have, have we gone through and assessed all of those? Have they come to you with those potential needs? Yes, yeah, so you're, annually we have a uh, laser fish form currently that's being submitted by department heads uh, based on the funding requirements, like Ms. West said, the uh, $200,000 and above or multi-year. Uh, so they're, they're presented that early in the budgeting process. Those are submitted back in October to us, reviewed, placed through a scoring matrix, and went for a panel to get to this list. Okay, so what you're telling me then is that, you, that all departments have presented you their capital needs as of the presentation of this plan, they're already done, they're already presented for um, us to deal with in budget. There isn't, there's nothing outstanding. It could be outstanding. Uh, like I said, this was presented back in, I believe, September, this one out, received in October. Uh, uh -huh. you know, the Recreation Board meets monthly. If they have plans prior to that, so next year CIP plan should indicate the list they've come up with in the next few months. Okay. And I, I know there may be some level of debate over um, building a new detention center versus uh, a new ag center uh, in terms of where that priority lies in the chronological order that you have here. But I guess we'll have those discussions as we get in 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 to the budget. Any any other questions for Brad at this point? be a little different here so so my CIP has to be broke out for 10 years and the reason that the utility side CIP is a little different from the general fund CIP is because in all of our funding and, and grants that we that we reach out to get they want us we get more points for that 10-year funding um, but like the general fund CIP we're going to be changing pretty constantly on, on, on what we do and how we do it so the projects that you see tonight um, are, are, are set in stone, and we've already figured in t these projects are already in our rate increases over the next five years that you've seen. So um, the Kumi water system expansion, so, so that project is already underway, but we still have to leave that project in our CIP alone. You've already voted, you've already approved it. So, but due to the funding being pushed all the way out to most likely 2026, we have to leave it in there so the funding agency sees that we're still moving forward with it. So in the next project that we have is the Sparks Road generator replacement. So this generator in Sparks Road, you know, Sparks Road actually just celebrated its 30 year anniversary. So that plant's been there for 30 years. This is a, a key component to uh, running that facility when we have any type of power outages or, or things like that. Um, an estimated cost for that right now is about $800,000, and we plan to try to do that in 2026. Uh, the next project that you'll see is the repair and replacement of Devon Road Pump Station. So this pump station, as you can see by the pictures, again, this pump station was built in 1975. Um, of course, there's been some upgrades into it, but the, the footprint of this and how the water and, and utility system is growing We've just outgrown that footprint. So to add bigger pumps and things like that in it, um, and most of our system um, was prior to 1980. Davie County actually took over the utility system in around 70, 1975. Um, the next one is the Green Hill Road pump station. So same thing, uh, this pump station was constructed in, in or around 75, 76. 
Um, it requires some some upgrading, some repair and replacement. As you can see by the pictures, again, the footprint is very small. Uh, a lot of people don't even know what it is when they're driving by. And, and that's the way we want to keep it hidden, out of the way, <laughs> out of focus. So um, and the cost for this is about $1.1 million. And what these pump stations do is we've got the Coolmead cool Water Treatment Plant in the south side of the county, and then we have uh, Sparks Road kind of northeastern side of the county. So we're moving water around about 450 square miles of water line throughout the day with these pump station filling tanks, keeping tanks levels, and everything of that nature. And then, of course, line extension and or replacement. So we look at our system on a yearly basis with engineers, and there's no one certain criteria to this. We do what's the three things that we look at for this is Health of the system, of course, resident needs, and I guess the last one would be trying to get rid of some of the dead end lines in the county because when this when this system was constructed, it was just extended to dead end lines to get as many people's water, and and those smaller lines have kind of come back to haunt us and um, create problems. So we're we're running larger lines besides smaller lines in the internal of the system to get further out in Davie County to get water out to the residents on, as far as we can. So, um, and again, this system wasn't designed at the beginning for fire protection. So now we've got to go back and try to design that in this older system. So, and we're, we're doing about $500,000 annually and over the last couple of years, as we know, the cost and everything has went up. So this was being put in our system on an annual basis. Now it's, it's kind of turned to a semi-annual basis. But all of these projects that you see that I've presented you tonight are already rolled into our rate increases. They're, they're things that we do, and um, we're trying to keep those very low. So we, we're, we're keeping this broke out into multi-year projects and, and trying to just do everything at once. Anybody have any questions on any of these for me? No? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment, if you don't mind. Please. Um, a lot of people on Main Church Road are very happy with our water department now. They had uh, water there that smelled terrible, and uh, they requested and received uh, county water to their area. So I'd like to say thank you for them doing that and uh, also to point out that to the board that I don't know if everybody knows it or not there was a 12 inch water main on 64 was it uh, 801 801 that broke the other day yeah. and everybody was there including the supervisor yeah. doing the work so uh, thank you guys yep. thank you thank you any more questions Just again to summarize, uh, we will be incorporating this capital improvement plan in with the budget public hearing that we plan to have at our June meeting. You'll hear more from Mitch from Davenport again. It'll be a longer presentation, um, but uh, you know, in the meantime, just let us know uh, about projects. This is where staff has kind of slated things to go for our plan. Again, even once we adopt the plan, we make amendments to it all the time. So, you know, it's not something, you know, it's a, a living document that we can adjust. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate all the work you've done. Any comments, commissioners, or questions? Okay. I think you covered our commission okay. questions. All right. And Ms. Robbins going to stay with us for just a second. I didn't wander very far. Uh, mm. Because I want to talk to you about the March financial summary. So what we have before you tonight, it starts on page 95 of your agenda packet. And uh, this is comparing March 2024, so July through March, to July through March of the previous fiscal year. As you can see, we've collected about $1.1 million more revenues than last fiscal year. Some of the major differences, as you can see, are the property tax collections are more by about $1.8 million. Uh, sales tax is starting to level off a little bit, but it's still greater than it was last fiscal year. Uh, we also have about $3.4 more million dollars more expenditures. Most of this is due to uh, the way we're accounting for 
transfers into other funds like the uh, capital improvement fund as well as the, the fire fund. Uh, most other items are pretty much comparable to last year. One change I've made on the schedule is I've moved operating transfers in to the bottom of the schedule, and this is just transfers in from other funds, you see. It's about $2.7 million more. This is mostly related to the Coronavirus Relief Fund, uh, just to kind of separate that out so we can look at it separately. But for right now, as of the end of March anyway, we have uh, $460,000 more revenues over expenditures than we did at this point last year. So uh, expenditures right now at the end of March are 6.63.49 percent of the budget. Just as a frame of reference, 75 percent is nine months worth. So let me know, let me know if you have any questions. Very good. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. All right, County Manager's report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I always like to take any opportunity that I can to recognize um, our great staff. Um, one in particular that I want to point out, he's trying to sneak out, but he's hiding in the back, uh, is Mr. Greg Forbes, who uh, recently this spring was named, uh, well, Greg is our community paramedic, uh, but he was named by the uh, Moxville Women's Club as their Citizen of the Year. I um, also think he may have been named Paramedic of the Year as well, so uh, Greg is riding a, a wave right now, but I wanted to recognize him for all the hard work that he does in the community. Um, he is being recognized and um, we're glad to have him. Um, this week we talked about Clerks Week, but it's also Nurses Week. It's also Correction Officer Week. Um, so we want to make sure that we show our appreciation to our staff that do those particular duties. Uh, this whole month of May is Foster Care Month. Um, so if you know anybody within the foster care service, uh, please show them some appreciation. Uh, one of our partner organizations that a lot of our staff work with is Davie County Smart, Smart Start of Davie County. Uh, if you happen to have a chance, um, they have a survey out on their website. They're trying to get information from parents who have small children uh, who are in that uh, pre-K age, and they're also trying to get information from employers uh, we're trying to close some of the gaps that we're experiencing in child care here in Davie County. So I think until the end of May, they have a survey up. So please take a look at that. Um, our uh, Health and Human Services would like to invite everybody to the Recovery Road Fair on May the 15th from 1.30 to 3 p.m. at the Government Center. Um, if you know of anybody that could use some of the resources um, that are available through Recovery, uh, please come out that day and learn more and support them. Um, our fire marshal and emergency management are conducting monthly um, events, education events here in Davie County. They had one this morning here at the factory. They're going to have one the first Monday of June and the first Monday of July in Bermuda Run and in Coolamy. On uh, next Tuesday morning, uh, May the 14th at 8.30, we will have our budget workshop to discuss our 2024 2025 budget and capital improvement plan and then finally um, we won't have another meeting again so i'd like to wish all the moms out there a happy mother's day and that's it thank you mr barnett any questions okay all right uh, do i have a motion to approve the consent agenda i make a motion to approve miss finney makes that motion do we have a second Mr. Poindexter, any discussion? All in favor? All right, any opposed? It's unanimous. Okay, under old business, item 12, deferred from the April 2024 meeting, zoning map amendment. Are you making a presentation, Mr. Easter? I can address at some point, I'm just pulling it up here, but also associated with that, I subsequently met with the applicant to kind of speak to the condition. Please, that, go ahead. That, that's what we're doing. So we can, this is just the same presentation, but subsequently uh, the applicant and I met um, and discussed these. Um, they agreed to them and we kind of amended from the previous planning board meetings as well as the last commissioner's meeting. Uh, 
the conditions that were agreed upon um, are the use of the property shall be limited to the following use. Building contractors general, that's specifically defined in our zoning ordinance. No outdoor storage. Any dumpster, dumpsters on the property shall be enclosed with a 10 foot opaque fence. The proposed building shall be at least 45 foot from the shared property line described as Davy County Tax Parcel G8000103. That is this property located here at the bottom of the screen. That is the address, it's 110 Sowers Lane. So that is the, the, the property here where the applicant agreed to shift uh, 45 foot. The applicant would add a 20 foot buffer consisting of two rows. One of the commissioners had mentioned to add another row of trees of evergreen conifers or broadleaf evergreens placed not more than five feet apart, which would grow with a continuous hedge at least six foot in height within two years of planting. Add an opaque fence within the buffer. Such fence shall be located a minimum six foot above finished grade. The buffer should cover the location of the proposed building to the east, south, and west, which if you look this corner here where the building is, can we set back, it would go to the corners down there. And the remainder of the property shall leave at least a 10-foot natural buffer on the rest of the property. Any questions? All right. Now, let me... Let me read what we have here. Can anybody any questions? I have one question. Okay, please. Do you have a map or a drawing where that how that's going to really look, where that building's going to be set? I do not. So on item five, the building being forty-five feet from the we'll call it the southernmost property line. Correct. To, okay. Correct. So originally that was twenty feet, so they moved it twenty-five feet. Is that right? Yes. Right. Originally it was twenty feet and moved it additionally 25 foot to be 45 foot. Just a general question, because I mean, I know the area pretty well, but can you put that last one? Which one? That one. Okay. The bit, the ones to the east, I guess, they're businesses, right? Now, which are those? Are Correct. The 2046 is the um elevator business and it's already currently as you can see it's already currently zoned the highway business conditional and the the property the 2054 i think it's a residential type use of the property just a general question on how do we go back and enforce or make sure that the conditions are being met so the applicant would have to submit a site plan before a zoning permit would be issued and have to indicate that all the conditions are there. So once the building is built and finally constructed, then at that time the general contractor would request a zoning inspection and we would go out there to ensure all the conditions are met before a CO could be issued with this. That's routine when there's specific consistent conditions associated with that. So. I would go out on the lot with the conditions, make sure, pull the measurements that everything is met. The trees are planted, the opaque fence is up, any fencing is there, the, how, uh, the property meets the necessary setback. And then at that time, we would, we would approve the zoning from that, that it meets the conditions set for it with the approval. And then they could continue on and the CO could be issued. How about into the future? Into the future, um, if we receive any complaints or anything like that, we don't per se do spot inspections. But if we notified that there's out there and they're in the zone in violation of this, then they would put, be put under notice and then we would follow the necessary enforcement procedures associated with that. So, for example, one of the things is outdoor storage. Okay, so if we identify there's outside storage, we receive a complaint, we go on site, we cite them. Um, from that standpoint, we would just follow the necessary legal uh, requirements to get them in compliance. Kind of relating to what Brent said in terms of the uh, stipulations that we put in, there will be, we, we, we're, we, we're hearing a lot about runoff, we're hearing about, about environmental issues here. Right. There will be a, a, a study done by the state Correct. in terms of environmental Correct. in regards to 
So, so prior, prior to this, they'll have to go through DOT to receive any kind of necessary commercial driveway permit. DOT would sign off. So at that time, it would be the subject based upon the use, based upon the location, based upon where it's at. Do they have to install a turning lane? Do they have to install? And that is at the, the cost of the developer. So the DOT would sign off on the same thing associated with any kind of grading permit, any runoff permit, or anything associated with that. The applicant, the contractor, would submit that to NCDEQ. They would review the plan from that storm standpoint. They would issue anything associated with runoff. And, and that's going to be subject to, number one, the location of the building, where the building sits, the side, and all that. So that, they'll require civil engineering to submit to the state for approval prior to they can get any kind of building permits to start construction with that. Okay. Yeah. If DEQ notices there's an issue, they can shut the project down or they can say this is, this is flawed for whatever Absolutely. geological reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're going to be subject. They'll they'll do whatever DEQ to issues the necessary permits. Like to stay out of that, just because hey, I don't know what it is. It could be retention ponds, it could be runoff, silt fencing. There's various things to catch the runoff with that. Um, and anything long term, anything here, we get calls constantly about water runoff and various residential, uh, commercial locations out that. There's a Winston-Salem regional office that would come investigate, and they, if they're found in violation, then they can find the state gets involved in that. So, so we do work hand in hand a lot of times with the EQ um, with getting remedy for for runoff or any kind of problems associated with that. Right down the street from this location, there's a neighbor whose yard's been destroyed from runoff from Ellis Middle School, and he continuously is told there's nothing anybody can do. So. <clears throat> Any other questions for Mr. Easter or comments? <clears throat> Not at this time. Okay, I'm going to read what we have here just to give us a, a format to, to roll out with this thing in terms of the motion. <laughs> um, this is deferred from our April 1st uh, meeting, Zoning Map Amendment G812. Uh, 0A006 located on North Carolina Highway 801 South consisting of approximately three acres from residential 20 and residential agricultural to highway business. And we have, I think as several have said, we've dealt with this for four months now through the planning board and now through our group. So. Um, do we have a motion? Mr. Mr. Chair, before you Please. do a motion, and now I saw these conditions for the first time when they were put placed into the agenda packet today, and I noticed that the applicant has not signed off on them as agreeing to those conditions, and I think we, we need to have that signature on the app, by the applicant on those conditions and I'll, before you pass something. I guess I, I was under that, that he would agree to those conditions. If any conditions subsequently could be added to it, then at that time he would add them, sign off on That's why we didn't, I didn't ask for the signature. Okay, so any, any, yeah. any motion, if it's for approval, should be conditioned upon his signature uh, before it actually becomes uh, a, an amendment to the zoning ordinance itself. Thank you for letting us know that. So whoever makes a motion, if there is a motion, uh, they would uh, uh, clarify that by the pending signature. Floor is now open. Mr. Chairman, I guess what I will open this up by saying uh, um, my grandmother lived next to this site and uh, all, all her life. And I've been there many, many times. I've been over all this property before probably any of these folks even, even lived there. I was all over that property. So I know just about every square foot of it. But uh, what my main concern is, is that uh, we be fair to everybody. We have three uh, parties here to be considered. Um, 
the first is the neighbors, the second is the business owner, and the third is the man who actually owns the property. I want it to be fair for all. The neighbors get all the restrictions placed by the county, plus the business has agreed to move his building and put a large, a larger buffer by 25 feet. He also agreed to have no outdoor storage and to provide extra shielding for any waste containers at his expense, all of it at his expense. The business owner gets to have his business even though it will cost more to do so. The property owner who has paid property tax on this property for decades without any income from it now gets to realize some income from it. Everyone sort of gets something from this. Nobody gets everything that they want. But I'd like to make this as close as fair to fair as possible for all people concerned because I know all the, the people involved in this. Um, I'm going to make the motion to approve this rezoning. Subject to these six conditions. Subject to all the conditions we have stated, plus if the subject to the guy signing off on it, the business owner. All right. We have a motion from Mr. Poindexter. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. Okay. Do we have any further discussion? Okay. All in favor of, uh, excuse me, please. I'm sorry. Yeah. This has been a very difficult decision to make in some ways. In other ways, it seems to be fairly cut and dry. But I would like to say what really weighs into the decision here is that you know, a lot of things is we're talking about individual property owner rights and what a person should or should not be allowed to do with their property. Um, the other issue that weighed on my decision on this would be that the zoning was approved by the planning board and it was all these issues were raised by the public. Uh, another issue that had to be considered is the property is in a commercial area as per the land use plan. There are numerous non-residential properties in that general area, and there was recently zoning approved next door for this property to be zoned business. Um, the environmental issues will be addressed if noted by DEQ, and the applicant addressed the issues raised by the planning board and the board of commissioners and agreed to conditions for this. Uh, in my heart, I would rather just see oak trees growing there for the forever. But at the end of the day, all of these things have to be looked at when deciding on an issue like this. And precedent has been set in this area, quite a bit of precedent as far as businesses and so forth. I feel like not taking all these things into consideration, even if your heart wants one thing, but precedent has been set otherwise, we would be setting a dangerous precedent to approve other properties for zoning such as this and to not and to have an excuse on how to deny this. So that's I just wanted to say that. I concur that um, it's a cut and dry decision, but on the opposite end of the spectrum for me, um, I think that it should be obvious that this is not the place for this type of business. This is not a neighborhood <coughs> type business. If it were a neighborhood friendly business, you would build it on your own property. And I wish we were taking landowners' rights into consideration if this is the direction that you are headed. So I'm sorry about that, y'all. 
Any other comments? Okay, we will we will call the vote. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, it's four to one. All right. Any new business? All right. Uh, commissioner's comments. Mr. Show. Shift gears here a little bit. Um, wanted to say something with regard to the pickleball questions tonight. Um, I think one of the things that uh, Paul and I have talked about, I don't know if Paul's still here in the room or not. There he is but didn't want to get too premature on it, but it gives a little impetus for this, is there are lots of uh, derelict-type tennis courts and other things throughout the county that um, could probably, we could partner with these churches, civic organizations or whatever. Um, we've got one example, and I didn't want it to be a real conflict of interest, but I remember back when tennis was such a big thing and our tennis court court was built in Advance Methodist, and then it became tennis courts, and they were almost always full of people playing there. Now, sadly enough, it's kind of become a little bit of an eyesore off and on, as nice as the property is there. So I would think this would be a good opportunity to address pickleball facility, pickleball capacity, and maybe look into something like we had at our church where there's the unused tennis courts, but they're fenced in areas, and maybe we could partner the county and the church or the county and these other civic groups could, or wherever they're located, community organizations, and look at a way to utilize these facilities better. So i just throw that out there. Thanks. Um, Brian pointed out some of the things that we recognize during the month of May. May is like everything month. Um, we've already recognized our National Day of Prayer, our clerk, correction officers, as Brian mentioned, nurses, teachers. This is Teacher Appreciation Week. Fire, International Firefighter Day was Saturday. Foster Care Month, Mental Health Month, Agriculture Month, Public Works Month. There's an EMS celebration this month. Um, older Americans. So... This is just the month to celebrate everything, and I don't want to miss anybody, and I probably still did, but thank all of you in those areas for what you do. Um, does Greg still here? So Greg Forbes does not like to be bragged on, but let me tell you, we cannot brag on him enough. He, he is just making a difference in this world, and, and I just am proud of what he and all that group there is doing, and there's folks in Suzanne's department helping and more folks in Joseph's department helping. It's, it's an effort. It's a group effort. We, we kind of put him in the forefront, but he, a lot of people are backing him up, and I appreciate every one of them. Um, in the morning, we're having prom promise at the high school, so I'm pretty excited about that. And um, the rescue squad, EMS, fire marshal, fire departments, there's tons of people involved in that to bring some awareness to the high school students about prom safety and driving safety and um, I'll be there and I'm looking forward to it and I'm very grateful for the volunteers and employees that have put that together. Thank you all so much for doing that. Richard? Uh, first, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of you for coming out tonight, even those that didn't stay. Um, congratulations to Kim and her group at Senior Services. They do a wonderful job an awesome job as do all our county employees we really appreciate them uh, thank y'all for coming out tonight hope to see you again next month mr Brindiger. i'd like to thank everyone for being here as always uh, good to see a full house um, the rezoning issue it was um it took a lot of time that was making some sausage but anyway it was um tough but I appreciate everyone's input and everyone's concern 
as we work through that. Uh, to the gentleman that spoke about the pickleball, um, that is that is addictive, but I can tell you that it's rough on your knees. <laughs> on my second lesson, I had to end it up in the hospital. So, But uh, it, it is addictive, and it is good as the population is graying here in Davie County. That uh, and I, point's well taken, that we need to, perhaps need some more facilities. Um, all the disciplines that are recognized this month, uh, they're all very worthy and deserving. Um, well, one that's uh, that being involved with human services, the foster care area, uh, those folks are, it's hard to find people in the foster care willing to serve. And uh, so just thinking about them as le hearing all the disciplines being recognized this month. And um, I want to, um, again, congratulations to Kim Chesky and her group and the five-year master aging plan. Uh, a lot of work went into that. And um, with that, I will look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, we uh, Sometimes we have to make very emotional, tough, uh, prayerful considerations, and tonight was one of those. And so... Uh, uh, I concur with all the other commissioners and thank those that have worked with us uh, to come uh, hopefully to a reasonable decision on that rezoning issue. Uh, we are going to go into closed session. Uh, closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3 to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body, uh, which privilege is hereby acknowledged. Uh, we will come back after that to have a vote on the issue discussed in uh, closed session by motion. So do I have a, a motion to go into closed session? Mr. Poindexter, do I have a second? Second. Ms. Finney, all in favor? All right. We we will go into closed session. Thank you. Motion that you agree to allow an amendment to the complaint to Can you read that. Okay. I'll be glad to. Is she recording? Right, we've all, we've had a motion to already we have motion to come out of closed session. Do I have a motion to go back in, back into? Okay, Richard makes the motion. I'll second. Benita seconds. All in favor? All right. Now, uh, we we have to vote on a closed session item, and we need the, the term of. Okay. Based, based upon the conversation we had in closed session with regards to the national opioid litigation, uh, we received a letter April 26, 2024, in which the uh, council for the op national opioid litigation has indicated that there is a good possibility that they could go after the pharmacy benefit managers, better known as PBMs, and that Judge Polster as recently uh, open bellwether tracking case against some of these PBMs and that he is uh, considering allowing the uh, counties and other organizations to amend their complaint. And what we would need is a motion that we agree to amend the complaint uh, that we currently have pending. Do I have a motion? I would make that motion. Richard makes the motion. I will and second it. Terry seconds. We have the wording of amending the uh, uh, opioid agreement. Okay. Any and other? I, I will uh, send an email out to the people that I'm supposed to send it out to with the language in it uh, saying we agree. Okay. Thank, thank you, Ed. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor? That is unanimous. Do I have a motion to adjourn?
So moved. Ms. Finney makes that motion. Do we have a second? Richard seconds. Mr. Poindexter, all in favor? All right, that is unanimous too. We stand adjourned.